Philippians 3 and verse 1. I hope you will just forgive me this morning. I, I'm trying to be focused, but I'm very uh, well aware of the fact that I'm going to be a granddad any day. Actually, not a granddad. I'm going to be an opa. That's the Dutch word for granddad. I'm excited about that. I saw Dixie give me a, a fist pump back there. She understands. There's something about being an opa. It's an exciting time. I'm thrilled for my, my daughter and for my son-in-law. We're gonna, they're going to grow their family, and it's, an ex, it's very, very exciting. I, I'm told it's going to be a, a son, a grandson specifically. And, and uh, that's just a wonderful thing to hear. Um, I already have a nickname picked out. The child's not even born yet. Debbie's going, oh boy, here we go. <laughs> this is the opportunity you have to discover how strange my mind really is. Because when my daughter married Josh, his last name is Picard. And that immediately, as a Star Trek fan, made me think of Captain Picard. Now, the little guy's name is supposed to be Kenneth Isaiah Picard, which I shortened to his initials, K-I-P, so it became Captain Kip. You with me so far? Isn't that a great nickname, Captain Kip? But then I started thinking, you know, that might be a little long. I'm going to shorten it even further and call him just CK, short for Captain Kip. But then that was a problem because I started to think of Clark Kent, which means my grandson's going to be Superman. <laughs> we're, we're excited about this. We really are. I'm excited. You can probably tell. You can also tell I'm a little strange. Um, that's okay, because that means I'll fit right in. Um, <laughs> Because we're all a little strange, aren't we? We're all, we're all a little different in our own way. That doesn't actually make us uh, the same. It makes us unique. Um, but there's, there is a problem with this whole situation. There is. And, and anybody, I, I didn't realize how true this was, but anybody who's a grandparent here can attest to this problem. It, it, it's hard enough when you're the parent or about to be parent and you're watching your spouse give birth. I still have scars from those moments, literally, from my wife's fingernails every time she had a contraction, you know, digging in. But, but the reality is that childbirth, I'm told, as a man, I can't understand it possibly, but it's, it's incredibly painful, and that's my little girl. That's my little girl, my baby, my firstborn. And I'm looking at this pain that she's about to go through, and I'm seeing the look on her face as she considers it, and she last night even was just saying she wants to go back three months so she has more time. Because now that it's here, the reality is she's, she's looking at right in the eyeballs. That it's about to be get real, isn't it? You know? and, and you fellas probably know what I mean by this. For, for a lot of us guys, it's not till the moment the baby's born that it becomes real. Like we watch our wife changing for nine months and, and we just kind of learn to duck and cover a little bit because there's some strange stuff happening there. But it's the moment when the child's born, right? And as I wrestle with this question of the pain she's going to th through, I can't help but ask the question, is it worth it? Is the pain of childbirth worth it? And I don't know a parent who on the good days would say anything but absolutely. Every parent on the bad days has thought, what was I thinking? I know that. I'm a parent. I understand. But when you ask the question, honestly, you say, well, is it worth it? Is the pain worth it? Is the risk worth it? The, there's no question whatsoever, is there? The, the answer is absolutely. When, you, when I was, I got to hold my daughter before Debbie did. And they, you know, there I am, this new dad. I'd never babysat. I'd never held an infant before in my life. And I'm afraid I'm going to break her, right? Fellas, some of you know what I'm talking about. And, and something, the moment you hold that child and you look at her and you go, something changes inside of you. You're never the same again. And, you, and the, the pain is no longer a concern. If it was, no woman would ever have more than one child. Somehow, the, the, the value of that child goes so far that the pain becomes something to go, yeah, that, that was worth it. Oh, man, it was hard. And, and women tell stories, and they say it's for a man. It'd be like, take your lip and pull it over your head, and you might get close. Right? That's just close, fellas. But this question, is it worth it? The answer was absolutely Yes. Because some things in this life are worth sacrificing for. Some things in this life are worth suffering through. Some things are worth paying any price so that we can lay hold of them and claim them. Some things are worth the cost. 
no matter what. I think about Paul writing to the Philippian church. And he's in a a dark place, my friends. Make no mistake. I love the book of Philippians. It's one of the most encouraging letters you'll ever read. But he writes from a dark and dangerous place. He's in prison when he writes this letter. He's on trial and literally his life is at stake, depending on what judgment will come. And it's in these moments that Paul chooses to declare that Jesus Christ is worth it. He wants us to know from his perspective, he puts it this way early in the book. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. To live is Christ and to die is gain. And what he's saying there, he says, Jesus Christ is worth it. If I live, I get Christ. If I die, it's even better. I get to be with Christ. It's worth any price. I want to be clear this morning. Make no mistake, there is a cost to following Jesus. Salvation is free, but following Him has a cost. It's going to require something from you. If you choose to put your faith in Jesus Christ, to follow Him as Lord, to believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, then I declare to you this morning, there will be a cost. And Paul wants you to know that there's a cost, but he wants you to know that the cost is worth it. He wants you to know that no matter how great the cost, no matter how much pain it causes, Jesus Christ is worth knowing. I believe that's true. That's why I stand before you each Sunday, because I'm convinced of the truth of this. I believe it's worth being 18 hours drive from all my family. It's worth any cost. It's worth every Christmas I don't go home to see my biological family because I spend it with the people of God. That's my commitment as a pastor. Every Christmas Eve, my family says, you coming home this year? They don't even ask anymore. How many of you are willing to give up your Christmas celebrations? My friends, there's a a value here that we need to see. And today I want you to wrestle with this question. Is Jesus worth it for me? Is he really worth it? Am I willing to pay the price of following him, really following him? Am I willing to understand what it means? Am I willing to come and surrender? Maybe it's just your pride you have to let go of. The feeling, the thought that you can do it all yourself, that you don't need any help. I'm going to tell you right up front, by the end of this message today, I'm going to ask you to make a choice. I'm going to give you the opportunity to decide for yourself whether Jesus Christ is worth it. See, Paul wants us to count the cost. In chapter 3, the real cost of following Jesus and what we need to do to understand the difference between deciding how much to give and deciding to give it all. And to make some choices about that. And he wants to help us understand how he can can feel this way. How he can see that Jesus is worth giving everything for. Listen how he starts in verse 1. He says, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. What's Paul saying? He's saying, listen, I may be in jail, I may be on trial for my life, but I have no problem saying this as many times as it takes so that you can understand this truth. It's no trouble for me. How many of us, when we were in a hard spot, in a dark place, in prison as it were, are thinking to ourselves, gee, it's no trouble for me to do something for somebody else? No, we're usually focused on our own problems, aren't we? But Paul is so convinced that Jesus is worth the cost. He says, it's not, it's not even, he doesn't say, oh, it was hard, but I did it for you because I cared. No, no. He says, it's no trouble. This is what it's really all about. This is what really matters. He says, it's safe for you. Why? The reason we preach the gospel every Sunday, the reason we keep talking about this story, we sing that song. I love to tell this story. Why do we do that? Because it's safe for us to have it repeated over and over again so we never forget what God has done for us, who Jesus Christ is. 
And Paul wants us to question, consider, what is it we really put our faith in? Look at verse 2. He says, look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. He's talking about a group called Judaizers back in those days. So Paul had gone out and proclaimed the gospel, the good news, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, declare him, Lord, you will be saved. There's these people coming along behind who were Jewish folks who'd gotten saved, but they were convinced that you still had to do a bunch of things that that was not enough. Yeah, I'll take Jesus too, but you also have to be circumcised and every man cringes. And Paul says, listen, if you think that you have to add anything to the grace of God, you're not doing anything but mutilation. That's brutality. That's making a mess of things because nothing else is needed. And we know people like this. You may say, well, no, I don't know anybody walking around saying, let's circumcise, fellas. Okay, true enough. But we do know people who are legalistic, don't we? Amen. Anybody know a legalistic person? You know, somebody who's come up to you at some point in your life and said, if you were really a Christian, you would. Or the other side, it's, it's opposite. Christians shouldn't do things like that. Anybody heard about that from time to time? Had people try and tell you what a Christian should look like? Try and fit you into their little mold? The reality is today, just like then, there are people who are trying to add law to the good news of grace. My friends, we cannot let them. We cannot accept that imposition on it. I love Galatians 5.1. It says, it was for freedom that Christ died to set you free. Stand firm then. And don't let anyone take away your freedom. So you have this invitation from Paul to consider that what we do is, is not the point. That what we do cannot earn grace. He says in verse 3, we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. If your journey is rooted in, well, Jeff, I got up this morning, didn't I? And I got my family ready, didn't I? And I got to church, didn't I? And I put money in the plate, didn't I? And I sang the songs, didn't I? Guess what, my friends? So what? Because you cannot give your way to God. The only thing you can do is receive His grace. Paul says it that way, so it's perfectly clear. We put no confidence in the clash. He said, he's saying literally, I don't care if you cut off parts of your anatomy. You cannot earn your way to God. Nothing you can do will take you there. Because salvation is rooted in faith alone, by grace alone, through Christ alone. It's the only answer any of us have. God's forgiveness cannot be bought, only received. I remember as a teenager, I, I loved video games. <laughs> Back in the days of the arcade, I know you probably have to explain to young people what that is, but this is when we didn't have computers and Game Boys and you know, Xboxes and all the rest of that stuff. We had to actually go to a building, usually next to a variety store so you could get change, and put quarters in the machine to play a game. And I loved video games. I really did. I was, I was addicted back in those days. I really was. I just, I loved them. And one day I noticed that my mother had been stashing quarters and loonies in her ashtray in her car. I had no job, no way to get money. I thought, she won't miss a few quarters. So I took a few quarters. And sure enough, nothing. She didn't say anything. Didn't notice. Oh, this is good. Took a few more. And literally, for a couple months, she was constantly refilling and somehow didn't notice the thing never got full. And I thought. Until the day she confronted me on it. And that feeling of losing my mother's trust just broke my heart. I mean, there I was probably about 15 years old. I mean, I knew better. I knew what I was doing was wrong. And again, no job, no way, no way to repay her. And I will never forget the moment she just looked at me. She said, I forgive you. She didn't have to do that. Nothing to do I could do. No apology I could make. 
That's what God does, my friends. When we can't pay Him back, when we can't make up for what we've done, He accepts the cost. My mom had lost all that money. Jesus Christ lost His life for you and for me so that we could live, so we could be forgiven. Because the point is what God does. Now, when we talk about the cost, holiness, becoming like Jesus Christ, is going to require a change in your behavior. But that's what God's Holy Spirit does. He will show you what you need to change, and He will empower you to make those changes. We don't have to listen to somebody else saying, you should stop this or that. Because if God wants you to change, believe me, my friends, He will lay it on your heart. He will convict you of your sin. He will give you the desire to change, and then He will give you the power to do it. None of that is us. This is why He's worth it, because God does the work. We don't have to do it. Paul doesn't trust in his efforts in the flesh. He understands that what we need is that circumcision of the heart, something only someone else can do, only God can do. Where He transforms us from dead to alive. At the end of the day, none of us have grounds for confidence before God. I look at my brother Hugh there and his great testimony, his great story. Many of you know it. He doesn't sit here praising God because he says, man, I'm, I'm a great Christian. He sits here praising God because he knows the truth. It's only by the grace of God that he's sitting here. He and Barb, every one of us, that's the truth. Paul even looks at what he tried to do. Listen to verse 4 to to 6. He says, Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh. He's trying to argue against these Judaizers, these legalistic people. And he says, Listen, you want to talk about legalism? Let me tell you my resume. Let me tell you who I really am when I look at it from your eyes. He says, I have confidence in the flesh also. If anyone thinks he has a reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. How's that for some arrogance? Paul says, listen, if you want to brag about achievements, I'll give you my list. Verse 5, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. God's saying, listen, or Paul's saying, listen, on the eighth day, according to the law, every true Jewish child, boy, needs to be circumcised. That was me. I wasn't a convert to Judaism. I was born there. You want to start with reputation? I can start with my genetics, he says. It says, I followed the law. My family followed the law. I'm even from the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, one of the most favorite tribes. He's so diligent about the law that he'd become a Pharisee. Now, to become a Pharisee was a challenging thing. These are the religious leaders of the day. They were so meticulous about the law that if you can imagine, if you had a little window box in your, in your house with some herbs growing in it, they would literally go through if they had leaves on a mint plant And they would count the number of leaves and give 10% of the leaves. They were so meticulous about tithing and obeying the law. Paul says, listen, I was so good at it. I was a Pharisee. I was, as to zeal, he says, a persecutor of the church. He was so convinced the early church had got it wrong that he was willing to go and hunt down Christians in upholding the law of God. He was willing to literally have them in prison. We know he was there at the stoning of Stephen. He says, I was a persecutor of the church. He says, as to righteousness under the law, I was blameless. Raise your hand if you're blameless this morning. Paul says, listen, by human standards, I was blameless. Listen to where he goes. He says this, indeed, I count everything. Sorry, verse 7, i got to back up one. Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Hear that? He's just finished listing off his resume, and he looks at the people he's talking to, and he says, listen, all of that, I'd lose it in a heartbeat for the chance to know Jesus, for the opportunity to draw close to him. Say, really, Paul, you, 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 you just count it as loss? Like, okay, just write it off? Right? That, we do that sometimes, right? There's things we just go, oh, I'm just going to write it off. Somebody owes you money and you know you're never going to get paid back. And you just go, I'm just going to write it off. I'll forget about it because I don't want it hanging over me. Right? Translation, garbage. 
He counts everything as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. If you're anything like me, you've spent large parts of your... For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. Translation, garbage. He counts everything as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. If you're anything like me, you've spent large parts of your time working very hard to try and please God. To make up for the things you've done in your life. Even after you become a believer, perhaps, you've had those times when you fell far away from Him and you thought, Oh God, I'm so far, I'm going to have to work really hard to get back to you, God. So no, I count all things rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. And he found it in verse 9. Why? Because he's going to trust in what God does. That when we lose all that other stuff, we gain something far more valuable. Someone far more valuable. See, Paul learned to count his advantages as liabilities. We so often look to our bank accounts, to our healthy families, to all these things we've achieved in life and think, there, that's proof that God is with me. That's proof I must be doing something right. No, it's not. It's proof that God is God and has made His choice to bless you. It has nothing to do with what you've done, everything to do with who He is. My friends, do we understand this? I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For His sake I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him not having a righteousness of my own. To be righteous is to be right with God. To be righteous is to be right with God. And it's not ours. It's something He does, something He gives when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. It's not about how much we fail. He says, I don't have a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. Not belief. Faith. I believe that's a chair. I believe this is a floor. It's not faith until you sit on it and walk on it. Okay? So the Bible says even the demons believe in Jesus and tremble. Anybody expect to meet some demons in heaven? It's not enough to believe. Put your faith in Christ. Put your money where your mouth is. Make a decision. If he's worth it, follow him. See, the irony for Paul in his life was that he had worked so hard to be perfect. He had worked so hard to earn God's favor. And here's the irony, that the harder he worked, the further he got from God. My friends, sometimes the only thing we can do is understand this, that you have to lose religion to gain salvation. You have to lose legalism to gain Christ. You have to lose trying to do it yourself in order to truly come to God through Christ. The only way we can come is understanding you cannot earn it, you cannot claim it unless you trust and follow Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. It's the only option we have. So Paul says he considers it all garbage. He's willing to lose everything. It's like Jesus himself told the two great parables, right? The parable of the treasure hidden in the field and the parable of the, the pearl of great value. And those great stories, I love them. Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven. He says, listen, there's a man out plowing in his field one day and he discovers a very hidden treasure and he goes and sells everything he has to buy that field. 
It's worth having the treasure that's in the field. He talks about the pearl merchant who's searching the world for that perfect pearl. And when he finds it, he sells everything he has. He doesn't keep a little stock back in case something doesn't work out. He says, I'm going to give everything I have because I need that pearl. That's what Paul says. That's how worth having Jesus is in our lives. Because God has done the work. Paul simply lets us know if coming to Christ costs you everything, it's worth it. Coming to Christ costs you everything, he's worth it. Because my friends, if you know Jesus, that means he knows you. And he can speak on your behalf before the Father. If you know Jesus, he knows you. And he can speak on your behalf before the Father. It's no longer about what you did or didn't do. It's about who he is. And the truth is there are many people. My experience tells me there's many people sitting here right this morning who maybe have been in church many years. And still think it's about what they do. At least they live their lives that way. Still trying to earn God's favor. But Jesus in Matthew 7 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. <laughs> On that day, many will say to me, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. So you need to choose. Because if you think doing stuff is going to make sure that Jesus knows you, it doesn't work that way. The fame does not work that way in the kingdom of heaven. A righteousness depends on faith, not works. There's no fear there. See, the problem with trying to be perfect is simple. Have you ever tried to be perfect? It took me three tries to get my driver's test. The problem with being perfect or trying to be perfect is this. That I guarantee you, no matter how many days in a row you pull it off, that sooner or later you won't be. And if your salvation depends on from this day till the day you die being perfect every moment of every day, you're doomed. Because nobody gets it right every time. But if your salvation depends not on what you do, but what he did, you have nothing to fear. You have no failure, no mistake that you can't come back from because you know it's not about what you did or do. It's about what he did once and for all. Paul wants us to see this, to know this, to have it crystal clear in our minds. He says, it's so worth it. He says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. He says, I even want to share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. We've all heard that expression, if you want to know someone, you should walk a mile in their shoes, right? Paul says, listen, if I have to suffer, that just helps me to know even more how worth following him is. Because I'll understand what he suffered for me. I will value it all the more. I will appreciate it all the more. Because this is a gift from God. He, he goes on to say, listen, that by any means possible. What's that word, any mean? Is there a boundary on any? Is there a fence around that somewhere? By any means possible. Verse 11. I may attain the resurrection from the dead. We live in a world that's afraid to die. Just watch all the makeover shows and you see all these old, older folks trying to look young again. And ultimately, it's not just about self-image, it's about fear. That on the other side, if I get old, I'm going to die, and if I die... Then what? 
Paul says, Christ is so worth having. I will do whatever it takes. I'll suffer whatever it takes because I want this thing most of all to be with him, to attain the resurrection of the dead. Eternal life is a gift from God. It's only a gift. There's only a way to get it. You can't earn it, but it's worth having. You cannot buy it, but it's worth paying for. You cannot steal it. It must be given as a gift. And God gives it to anyone who will put their faith in Jesus Christ and follow. That's why Jesus Christ is worth it. It really is as simple as that card they hold up at hockey games and baseball games. It says John 3.16 on it. It really is that simple. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him would never die but have everlasting life. It really is that simple. It's an incredible truth. All you do have to do, all you have to do is say one simple thing to God. Give me Jesus. That's all you need to do. Give me Jesus. My friends, I can promise you this. Like the pain that leads to the birth of a child, when you surrender yourself to Him, you will discover it's worth it. It not only may, but probably will cost you. It probably will cause you pain. You may even have to give up some good things in order to gain what is great, but it's worth it. Jesus Christ is worth it. Listen again to Paul's words in verse 8. I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For His sake I suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. What's he really saying? Whatever the cost, Jesus is worth it. Whatever the cost, give me Jesus. 